Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot Lo Mode and today on Hot Lo Mode we are coming to you with a video explaining Sabrina, the Audrey Hepburn sophomore film that cemented her as a fashion icon but at the same time was filled with so much catty fashion drama, he said, she said, we had to get into it. So without further ado, let's get into this breakdown of the film's fashion as well as some interesting information about stolen Givenchy designs and a lack of Oscar nominations. As we all know, Audrey Hepburn is one of the West's most famous actresses. Her doe eyes, her dry humor, and acting abilities made her a bona fide star, but her fashion sense was something all of its own. In this video, we are gonna be visiting one of her most stylish on-screen appearances and one that helped to cement her relationship with the French couturier Hubert de Givenchy. Now, many may think it's the iconic movie, Breakfast at Tiffany's, but it's actually a role Audrey did previous to Breakfast at Tiffany's called Sabrina. I will say that I highly recommend you watch Sabrina on your own, as this will be a loose retelling of the story, focusing much more on the wardrobe than on the actual storyline. Sabrina debuted in 1954, starring Humphrey Bogart and a then-rising star, Audrey Hepburn. With Disputed wardrobe designed by Edith Head, but more on that later. Audrey was hot off her smashing success, Roman Holiday, which had only premiered 354 days earlier than Sabrina, and Sabrina the movie had been adapted from the stage play Sabrina Fair, written by Samuel A. Taylor, which had only debuted in 1953. The story follows Sabrina Fairchild, the daughter of a chauffeur to the ritzy Larrabee family, as she falls in love with the heiress to the Larrabee fortune over time. And now let's get into the movie. So as we were introduced to a young Young Sabrina on screen, she is helping her father wash a beautiful black car belonging to the Larrabee family on their estate. Sabrina is meant to look like a chauffeur's daughter, with her father being a working class British driver for the wealthy Larrabees. And even if she's meant to look a little bit more middle or working class, Audrey in black and white is still a vision. However, styling her without shoes is not exactly what I would have chosen for her. Audrey Hepburn's go-to shoes usually were flats, and many could consider bare feet as the original pair of flats, so I get it. I guess. But seeing as how we are meant to see the difference between the world Sabrina lives in and the world of the Larrabees, this shoe choice, or lack thereof, is actually kind of a really great metaphor. The movie was released at the height of Christian Dior's fame and when his new look silhouette was taking over the world. But seeing this hourglass silhouette shows that even though Sabrina was of a working class background, the hyper feminized shapes of the haute couturier did trickle down to the masses. While Sabrina might not have had the luxurious fabric and meters of tulle or netting underneath her dress, like those she looked out at attending a party on the Larrabee estate, her dress still carries that essential silhouette tight bodice, even tighter waist, and flared out skirt. Sabrina's look also adds a casualness and workwear sensibility to it with the black t-shirt underneath. I mean, it also helps to see that she's helping her father with his work too. The dress is made up of a gridded motif as well, which we can see up close, which doesn't have the time-consuming embroidery or delicate trims of some of the guests she sees. Then Sabrina from atop a tree introduces us to the actual Larrabee family, who are incredibly wealthy and high up in society, and consists of the patriarch Oliver Larrabee, the matriarch, Maud Larrabee, their oldest son and serious businessman, Linus Larrabee, and their playboy youngest son, David Larrabee. We quickly get to see David's bachelor ways as he stops a random young woman in the most stunning dress. Not of the whole movie, but like the most stunning we've seen thus far. The way it fits and grows bigger as it descends is so aesthetically pleasing, and I can't stop thinking about her little shawl. It just floats so beautifully. But we come to find out the issue with the dress this young woman wears is that it's actually just not worn by Sabrina herself, as she is infatuated with David Larrabee. She fawns over him so much that in her desperation, she even tried to kill herself by inhaling fumes from the Larrabee's car, but is actually saved by the sullen and somber lioness and carried off to her bedroom. We also find out that Sabrina is supposed to head off to Paris to become a professional chef. She wears an apron over her dress, which might have been a way to make a more utilitarian garment more exciting on screen, or it could just have been that Sabrina was actually just trying to learn how to be a good chef, both are options considering it was the 1950s. We then see a shot where Sabrina is in her room about to graduate from cooking school and writing a letter to her father. She finishes her writing and proceeds to look out of her window, even when wearing a simple white robe in the comfort of her own home. An hourglass figure is created and seems to fulfill a body standard 
of the period. It's incredibly interesting to note that even a dressing gown in the 1950s seems to have that Dior new look silhouette. Sabrina also proposes to quote, never run away from life because she has learned to be of the world. She even tells her father, if you have any trouble recognizing me, I'll be the most sophisticated woman in the Glen Clove station. And honestly, I smell a fashion makeover coming up because Sabrina is coming back to the US. I will also say, Glen Clove Station is a train station in Long Island, Sabrina. I genuinely don't think you'll have too much competition in the sophistication department. The next scene is of Sabrina dressed in a fitted Oxford gray wool skirt set with black gloves and a white head wrap that has a black circle on the crown of her head, which is a full look by none other than Hubert de Givenchy. The skirt is shin length and Audrey wears heels, which may help the viewer distinguish that Sabrina has grown up and has truly become the peak of sophistication as she asserted in her letters. And the way the head wrap is done is interesting as it has the draping of a turban but is made much less formal by being converted into this headband. David Larrabee just happens to be driving by the station when he spots Sabrina. He stops his car and doesn't recognize her and all of her splendor but I have to recognize that impeccable jacket as he loads her bags into the car as he should. I mean let's also shout out those seven buttons. They just have a deepness to them and the placement of just one right below the neckline easily draws your eye down into the others and Audrey's waist too. And well, this is a pretty important wardrobe moment. This is the first on-screen appearance ever of Audrey Hepburn wearing Hubert de Givenchy's haute couture or Hubert de Givenchy's anything. Now, how did this relationship between the two come about? Well, I'm happy you asked. Somebody needed to. Audrey, in fact, asked the director of Sabrina, Billy Wilder, if Sabrina could come back from Paris really evoking the French lifestyle, which I guess at the time meant buying haute couture. Sure. The Larrabees seemed to pay particularly well, shockingly. Wilder luckily obliged Audrey, and off to Paris she went. She initially wanted to go to the Master of Shape, Cristobal Balenciaga, as was suggested by Billy Wilder's wife at that point in time. Now listen, Balenciaga was considered a god amongst the haute couturier, so it's good to know she had taste even that early on in her career. And there isn't really a clear answer to why she was turned away from Balenciaga, as some have said the brand told her that Balenciaga himself was too busy for Audrey, while others have been said to have made that decision on Balenciaga's behalf, as Hepburn's arrival was very close to Paris Fashion Week. But this didn't dissuade the young actress. Balenciaga at the time had become the mentor to many of the young crowd in Paris fashion design. We have Andre Correge, Emmanuel, Garo and Oscar de la Renta who had all worked under Balenciaga but Hepburn was recommended a young talent who actually he hadn't taught. A young aristocratic slim yet tall gentleman by the name of Hubert de Givenchy. Now Givenchy had started his brand in 1951 and was known for his simplicity and his separates. He had worked for Elsa Schiaparelli the famed surrealist designer of the 1930s for four years before going it alone. But one day he received a phone call from a friend named Gladys de Sagonzac who was actually the directrice of Elsa's Gabarelli's Atelier, and also happened to be married to the head of Paramount Studios' Paris branch, saying that an Audrey Hepburn wanted to meet with him immediately. When Hepburn had gone to meet Givenchy, he initially thought he would be meeting the legendary actress Catherine Hepburn, because Audrey's film Roman Holiday had actually not yet been released while she was in Paris. So when Givenchy saw Audrey, he was rather confused. His description of the young Hepburn was rather intriguing, as he said he met, quote, this very thin person with beautiful eyes eyes, short hair, thick eyebrows, very tiny trousers, ballerina shoes, and a little t-shirt. On her head was a straw gondolier's hat with a red ribbon around it that said Venezia. I thought, this is too much. Hepburn would later say that she actually had never seen an haute couture dress before, let alone worn one, and was actually wearing homemade clothing for the most part at this point in her career. Givenchy at this point though was only on his fourth collection as a young designer himself, trying to make it in Paris, and he didn't have as much flexibility or cash flow to help out this young actress, whose movies he had never seen. Givenchy told her, quote, I had very few workers and I needed all hands to help me with my next collection, which I had to show very soon, but she insisted, please, please, there must be something I can try on. He eventually let her try on some styles from his spring 1953 collection, with the first being, of course, this Oxford gray skirt suit. When she put it on, it was obvious that she had the model-esque figure of Givenchy's own models, and he began to quickly warm to her. 
He said, quote, The change from the little girl who arrived that morning was unbelievable. The way she moved in the suit, she was so happy. She said it was exactly what she wanted for the movie. She gave a life to the clothes. She had a way of installing herself in them that I have seen in no one else since except maybe the model Dalma. The suit just adapted to her. Something magic happened. Suddenly she felt good. You could feel her excitement, her joy. Now, something about Givenchy's clothes were so dashing, yet they had the politeness to allow the wearer to be the real star. I think that is evident in this piece, which is in fact such a testament to the character of Sabrina. She goes away loving this man and quite girlish, and in Paris she transforms herself into a more worldly and assured woman, and I think this suit reflects that. It's fitted impeccably, and from the side, oof, it creates that beautiful curved shape. Also, the flare of the jacket after it goes below the waist is truly Phenomenal. I feel that the wool actually holds its shape very well. That even after Audrey stretches to hug and greet everyone, the jacket almost jumps back into place, which could be a result of the textile and Givenchy's mastery of fabrics. And this excitement and joy translated on screen as well. David Larrabee initially invites Sabrina to go out in New York, but realizes the estate is holding a party that evening and he invites Sabrina there instead. Sabrina is excited to attend, even mentioning that she has, quote, a lovely evening dress with yards of skirt and way off the shoulder. And that she did. That was true. The party then begins with David and his soon-to-be wife, Elizabeth Tyson, I told you he was a dog, a wealthy heiress who is crucial to his older brother, Lioness's business merger plan, dancing together. Elizabeth wears a two-string pearl choker and a black strapless gown designed by Edith Head because she didn't have much else to do. The look Elizabeth wears, like David's interest in Elizabeth, isn't too strong. But when David notices Sabrina shuffling along to the party, his eyes open widely. And considering Audrey is wearing another gorgeous Givenchy ensemble, his eyes have the right idea. She saunters around that fern in a white strapless organdy gown, which features a detachable overskirt that flutters from behind her like a bustle dress attributed to the late 1800s. The floral embroidery found all over the dress and overskirt, more commonly called a detachable train nowadays, was the second on-screen airing of the relationship between Hubert and Audrey. There is also a noticeable difference in length between the actual dress and the attached train, with the train falling lower, and speaking of this train, the black silk gathering that exposes itself at the bottom of the train only further enhances the piece and once again reminds us of the technique seen in bustle skirts of the late 19th century. The dress is paired with a short white opera glove and a pair of black kitten heels, and in a scene where Sabrina and David are dancing alone, you can actually see again the hem of the dress is black, which almost outlines the white skirt overall. The train also creates a silhouette that resembles a traditional ball gown shape, which might also play into the idea that Sabrina's trip to Paris has truly set her apart from the rest of the ladies at the party. She doesn't strike out at the traditional shape, but rather plays on it in a way that makes her all the more desirable. I also can't get over the way the organdy, which is a quite lightweight fabric, feels so dense as Audrey sways around. While some in fashion at this time didn't believe that Hubert de Givenchy was terribly talented, I mean, let's be honest with ourselves, he was no Balenciaga or D he wasn't even really an Yves Saint Laurent. But the way that the black floral embroidery creeps up the bust and overskirt, like a group of slow and steady ivy moving itself up, is really wonderful. David begins then to dance with Sabrina and even introduces her to his mother while telling her to await his arrival in his usual hookup spot, the estate's tennis court. And the manner in which the dress glides with Sabrina as she runs off to meet David just adds to the magic. Now when Sabrina arrives at the tennis court, you also get to see the back of the dress as she swoons over the neck. And Sabrina even swings the dress around in what I assume was an imagining of her and David dancing together, which kind of reminded me of a peacock trotting around with its feathers down. It's clear in the tennis court dancing scene that Hepburn is magic on film. There's just this stunning siren quality about her that you could watch for forever. And it makes sense that along with Roman Holiday, Sabrina was another leg up for her career. We then see Linus appear as he realizes his brother is going to ruin his business plans, and he tries to put a stop to it by attempting to woo Sabrina himself. But while Linus was wooing Sabrina, Hepburn was wooing Bill Wilder. In filming the scene, he became so enamored with Hepburn's on-screen appearance and really wanted to drive it home. Wilder was so obsessed with capturing Hepburn's image that Humphrey Bogart, who was chosen second for the role and was actually notoriously difficult on set of this movie, complained that, quote, Wilder was getting only the back of his head in the tennis court shots because of how much Wilder was favoring Audrey. And to be fair, if Humphrey Bogart was wearing that dress that well, I would have focused the camera on him too. 
but he wasn't. Another interesting fact about this dress was it was actually originally designed in black with white train and embroidery, but Hubert changed the look after Audrey tried it on in the atelier as he understood that the scene that she was meant to wear it in was held at a summer party and a black dress wouldn't have been as light and airy in his mind. The next time we see Linus and Sabrina together is when he invites her to the Larrabee building as he continues his scheme of wooing Sabrina and getting her to move back to Paris in order to keep David in line. She wears another smashing dress by Givenchy, this one in black, and that would soon become Audrey's signature color. The armholes are carved out while the dress is tightly fitted on her bodice with that signature wasp waist and flares out above the hips. The dress is held together by two tied bows at the shoulders, as well as having a little plunge down the back, revealing quite a bit of skin, but it's also quite high in the front. The neckline was then deemed décollé Sabrina by Givenchy himself due to its popularity after the premiere of the film. The dress's skirt is a T length, which means it usually falls around the calves, which for many can be an extremely difficult silhouette to pull off. But Audrey's height allowed her to easily demonstrate a classic sophistication through it. She added another pair of gloves in black, some black kitten heels, and a hat by Givenchy as well. And the look culminates in an extremely graceful demonstration of subtle styling and great craftsmanship of the French haute couture houses. Just look at her waist, which isn't a Givenchy original to be fair, but the fact that the dress still clings to it, but shoots out that skirt like a rocket from the first millimeter of where her hip is is just tremendous. And it was clear to everybody that the dress was a smashing success, so much so that the dress began to be knocked off all around the United States. I mean, fast fashion isn't exactly a new thing if we're all being honest with ourselves here in this moment. The dress regardless is absolutely major, I mean that's clear without a doubt, and it's a moment that sealed Audrey Hepburn and Hubert de Givenchy's names in the Fashion Hall of Fame. It's also unfortunately the last time that we'll get to see this combo of Givenchy and Hepburn together on screen. We then see Sabrina deciding on whether or not she'll be going to see Linus in the Larrabee offices wearing an all-black ensemble with a large black wool coat wrapped around her that only runs shin length. And of course her skin-tight black capri pants expose her ankles. She paces about because she realizes she has no intention of actually going to Paris with Linus and heads up to his office with him. She unveils the outfit underneath the long coat as she dines with Linus to expose a black fitted sweater and we get a better look at her capri pants with black ballet flats too, which culminated in the quintessential Audrey silhouette. One can assume that because this look is not from the Givenchy selection of Hepburns that it was a look designed by Edith Head, but something about it seems to show that Head was taking inspiration from Givenchy regardless, as the sweater is the same plunging neckline in the back as the décolle Sabrina dress. As Linus's intentions to double cross Sabrina and actually send her back to Paris without him, she realizes and walks with such an air of conviction which is only bolstered by the deep plunge that one can't help but say, look what you're missing out on, Mr. Larrabee. And when Sabrina delivers the line, sorry, I can't stay to do the dishes, it only further reflects that Hepburn as an actress was defying this conventional norm of how women could be portrayed in film at the time. She ain't doing the dishes, she's wearing pants, and don't get your boxers in a twist about it, gentlemen. All right, so we're about to wrap up the film. Synopsis here. Essentially, the next day, the Tysons and the Larrabees have a meeting, and David eventually arrives, and let's to be known that he actually wants Linus to pursue Sabrina. As Sabrina awaits the boat's departure by herself, because she's like, listen, I'm just gonna go, whatever, fine, I'll go back to Paris if you guys really don't want me, we can see her stretched out on a deck chair wearing another shin-length wool coat, this time in some sort of lighter color that really can't be determined because, well, black and white movies, you know what I mean? But something about her black leather pumps, white gloves, and that upturned collar once again proves that no matter the designer of the outfit, Hepburn could sell a cool effect through the styling. Sabrina then eventually sees Linus aboard the ship, the two embrace, and then the film is over. Kaput. And now while the movie is ended, the tale of how the fashion in Sabrina came to be has not. This is where it's going to get juicy. Now as we mentioned earlier, Audrey Hepburn went to Paris to meet with Givenchy where he developed three styles to coincide with three very important moments within the movie. Audrey selected the gray wool suit where she meets David, the strapless white dress with train and embroidery for her entrance to the Larrabee party, and of course the black bateau T-length dress which went on to be named after her character. The synopsis nobody asked for. Now obviously Bill Wilder enjoyed these styles as as did Edith Head, and for those that again don't know, Edith Head was this legend in the world of Hollywood. During her lifetime, she had won 
eight Oscars awards for her costume designs in different films, and it designed costumes for legends like Princess Grace Kelly of Monaco, Elizabeth Taylor, Lana Turner, and Marlena Dietrich, to name just a few. During that time, Paramount's in-house costume designers made the costumes for the films, but for this project, they were based on the young couturier's designs, which caused a bit of an issue. Hubert de Givenchy was still an up-and-coming designer at this point, his own brand wasn't even three years old. And although he had support both verbally and allegedly financially from his mentor Cristobal Balenciaga, not getting credit for his work on an international platform was still a tremendous loss for his public persona and his brand. And Head had worked on Roman Holiday with Hepburn and was excited to also work on Sabrina, but Head didn't seem to be excited about sharing the limelight. Paramount's in-house costume designers did make the designs for Sabrina, like they physically sewed and constructed the garments, but again they were based on the young Givenchy's designs. And as a thank you to Hubert de Givenchy for taking a chance on the then unknown Hepburn, Hepburn invited him to a screening of the completed film, which he accepted. He joined her in Los Angeles and watched the film alongside her, but when the screen credits rolled, his name was nowhere to be found. The credits only named Edith Head as quote costume supervision, and remains this way still to this day. But the issue is, while Head and her department had created some of the costumes from scratch and had physically made the costumes that Givenchy had designed, or at least allegedly that's the story, they didn't actually create the inspiration for them, and they were made based on pre-existing designs from an haute couture atelier in Paris, also took inspiration to make some of the garments for the film based on those designs. As again, I mean that plunging black top in the back definitely is based on the décolleté Sabrina. Givenchy was rather insulted by the lack of credit. I mean, like, fair, I would be too. And later even said, imagine if I had received credit for Sabrina then, at the beginning of my career, it would have helped. But Givenchy was a respectful young man and didn't want to ruffle any feathers, so he kept quiet about the slight by head and Paramount for decades. It literally wasn't until like he literally was about to die that he was like, oh, yeah, me, thanks. Appreciate it. Now, the film went on to be very well received, as between Sabrina and Roman Holiday, it turned Hepburn into a bona fide star, even netting her a raise up to $350,000, which was quite the sum. Still is quite the sum. And when Hepburn continued to promote the film, as is still done today, she actually wore each of her Givenchy costumes to certain premieres in order to bring the styles into the real world. And I mean, we could say that this is an early example of method dressing now. The press department also went along with this notion of playing into the fashion element to promote the film, so much so that the film premiered in Paris just one day after Givenchy showed his fashion show during the Paris Fashion Week schedule. The film and her wardrobe made Hepburn more desirable, and it also gave her a bit more power when working on films going forward, which she would put to good use. And when the nominations for the Oscars came out for that year, Edith Head was nominated for Best Costume Designer for Sabrina, and was the only nomination the film received. But the bigger thing was, Hubert de Givenchy's name was still nowhere in sight. It was well known in the Hollywood costuming circles that Head refused to give credit to anyone, including her own team and assistants, even if she had little to do with the costume designs that were shown under her name. Now to be fair, for the most part, this is still an acceptable way to work within the fashion industry, but the film industry has gotten better, I think, at crediting people's names over time, or at least IMDb has made their names much more searchable. Now to add insult to injury, Edith Head even went on to win the Oscar. It's not an injury to win, but it's gonna get injurious real, real quick. And in her acceptance speech, made no mention of Givenchy. To be fair to Edith Head, she pretty much made no acceptance speech at all when she won. But if you watch the clip, the way she interacts with the host calling her name seems kind of weird. Like she rushes onto the stage, she gets her award, she shakes both of the host's hands, and then walks away from the podium entirely. And then tells one of the hosts to tell the audience she said, thank you? There's just something off about the whole thing. It seems to even shock the hosts a bit, and I wonder if it's because she knew that many of the designs weren't hers originally. Like, was this an admission of guilt? I mean, who knows? I would like to, but I don't know. But I'd like to. In general, Edith Head seems a little bit sus. Head would further double down on this notion that she designed the costumes for the film, writing in her two autobiographies that she designed the costumes. She even retorted to a reporter in the Los Angeles Times in April of 1974 when asked if she had designed everything herself, oui mon petit, and on being accused of copying, quote, I really didn't care. Couture has copied my things for years. In addition to countless other costume designers claiming theirs were the original ideas, it's all part of the business, unfortunately. And while I won't say that this is untrue, 
at all, because it's not. The fashion industry is known for tapping into other designers' designs to stay competitive, but there is a difference between a major film studio taking credit for the work of a small haute couturier versus a major haute couture brand knocking off a major film studio design. One of the things is a little bit more powerful than the other. But this whole charade did not go down well with Audrey Hepburn. Get it? Charade. Hepburn had found a camaraderie with Hubert, and with her newfound star power, she forced the studio to give credit to Givenchy. Now, while Givenchy lost the battle, his relationship with Audrey Hepburn lasted for nearly 40 years, meaning he won the war. And with her support, Givenchy was not just relegated to being a costume designer, but a full-blown couturier whose name still reigns today, with famous designers like John Galliano, Alexander McQueen, Claire White Keller, Ricardo Tichy, Oswald Boateng, and now Matthew Williams having all cut their teeth at the brand. As for Audrey Hepburn's beef with Edith Head, she was allegedly very upset with how Head treated Givenchy, and with her premier actor status, now could advocate for Hubert de Givenchy receiving credit. And she did. As for the film Funny Face, one of the most popular in the Hepburn lexicon, she made sure Givenchy received credits alongside Edith Head, and then he was nominated for an Oscar for the film in 1958. In the long run, Givenchy won. His name will last for quite some time, while Edith Head's will eventually fade into the background. I don't know what to tell you. Greed isn't a good look, especially when it's made up of knockoff Givenchy. Sabrina as a film, though, is one of the more overlooked Audrey Hepburn movies, in my opinion. I mean, many probably couldn't even name it when it comes to Audrey Hepburn films they know of, but this early classic was the reason that Audrey Hepburn became a fashion icon. And while others like Funny Face and Breakfast at Tiffany's and Charade added to her fashion lexicon, Sabrina will remain the movie that brought about the Audrey Hepburn and Hubert de Givenchy relationship. It will also be a scandalous he said, she said in fashion history too. So that is the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you guys would like me to continue working on these kinds of I, videos, you know, we worked hard on this one. It's something that I enjoy doing. We're working on being more fashion history involved, you know, here on all the mode. So please let me know if there are any other movies you guys want me to cover. I will see you guys in the next one and TTYL.